My name is Dr. David Wong. I'm a sports medicine physician at HSS Pramus. On today's webinar, we are going to talk about strategies that help to prevent injury while participating in winter sports. Our guests today are Dr. Sabrina Strickland and Debbie Jones. Dr. Strickland is a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon at HSS Manhattan and HSS Stanford, specializing in patellofemoral surgery. Debbie Jones is a physical therapist at our HSS Westchester location. And so uh, to begin, um, before we, we talk about trying to prevent injuries in, in sports, I think we first have to understand what injuries we're dealing with. And so Dr. Strickland, are, are there certain injuries you see an uptick in during uh, the start of winter sports season? Uh, absolutely. So I take care of a lot of skiers. I'm a skier. All my kids were ski racers. And um, certainly um, a lot of ski related injuries are, are unavoidable. And so I see everything from, because I do both shoulder and knee surgery, from falls onto outstretched arms with um, shoulder fractures, rotator cuff tears, labral tears, shoulder dislocations, and then by far the most common injury I see is an ACL tear. And, you know, sadly, you know, some people may describe a Bodie Miller type fall, but most people, they're getting off the chairlift and somebody leans into them, they tip over, or they're standing in the lift line and something happens. A lot of times it's not this catastrophic fall. It can be a very small, uh, small injury. Yeah, it's yeah, I've had similar experience when I was taking care of uh, you know skiers, even working at, at ski resorts. It's it's either the first run, they don't even get to the first run, they're just getting off the ski lift and they you know they get caught and, and fall, or it's you know the last run of the day, they they have a fall. And, um, and it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of people kind of lump skiers and snowboarders together, but you know, we know there's actually many different mechanisms and injury patterns between the two. You know, with our skiers, you know they're they're not kind of bound in and so their their skis can go in different directions which i think is why we see a lot more of those lower extremity and, and knee injuries and our snowboarders i'm sure dr say would have said you know they they actually with their both feet bound in they're going kind of slower speeds they can often brace themselves when they fall and so they're often landing more on their arms their hands we see a lot more wrist injuries um with our with our, our snowboarders um and you know, I think um, you know skiing. Yeah, like you mentioned, falling. You know, I know there's certain upper extremity injuries. You know, like there's a, a, an injury called skier's thumb that we, we see a lot of, um, where you know when, when people are skiing with their pole gets caught, it can you know kind of jam, pull their thumb, and, and you know injure one of the, the ligaments. And so you know, we see all different types of injuries with these um, winter sports. Um, but Debbie, do you do you think um, you know with, with winter sports and the cold environment from a physical therapy perspective? Do you feel like that, that cold environment increases the risk of, of injuries? Um, sure. You're going to see, obviously, you know, because it's colder, it's going to be a lot harder to warm your body up. Um, and that we know that that is problematic for any sport. Um, so making sure that you are, you know, that you get a good dynamic warm up in before you, before you get outside, before you get on the ice, whatever that will be. Um, and then, you know, taking some slow runs or just something to get yourself warmed up so that you're not immediately going out and expecting your body to um, do the do the most challenging thing it's going to need to do. Um, the other thing too is thinking about things like dehydration. Um, you know, because it's cold, you're not drinking quite as much. The the um, the air being drier. Um, so thinking about things like those types of more non orthopedic type injuries, but but keeping those in mind as well. You know, to add on to that, um, you know, sometimes, especially if you've been skiing your whole life, you almost don't think of it as a sport. And so besides um, getting in shape for the ski season, especially um, if you don't do a lot of exercises that resemble skiing, which most of us, us don't, um, it's really important um, to start slow. You know, this is not, the, you, don't, you don't necessarily go to the top of the mountain on your first run and, Every ski season should start by going to the ski shop and having your skis, skis tuned and your bindings checked. I, I've had some, I, I had a memorable fall in Snowbird a few years ago. And when I, took my, when I took my skis in, because my binding just gave way, somehow the setting had completely um, changed on one of my ski, ski bindings. And that's the kind of thing that you need to check or you need to have somebody check. It's not very expensive to have your bindings checked at the beginning of every season. And you certainly should have your skis um, sharpened. Yeah, I think that's that's probably true for a lot of the the winter sports, like especially our, our figure skaters, our hockey players. The yeah, same thing with like their their skates. You know, I think a lot of the injuries we see in, in figure skaters, you know, it's either overuse or it's just poor fitting equipment or or poor blades. And so, yeah, I think you know, anytime you start a, a new sport or new season, 
yeah, definitely getting your equipment checked out, especially our, our younger athletes who are growing. Um, you know, you, what you used last year may not be what you need to use this year. Um, and so I think that's definitely great advice to you know, make sure you're always monitoring your equipment, making sure it gets checked, um, you know, every year before you go out and, and start uh, whatever sport you're, you're participating in. And Deb, you mentioned, you know, getting kind of good warm up before you, before you go out, you know, are there certain exercises that you would typically recommend or a certain routine that, that you would recommend for our athletes before they get on the ice or get on, onto the slopes? Um, so there's a, you know, there's a, depending on the situation and equipment and all those kinds of things, um, there's certain uh, movements that you can do. Um, um, high kicks, knee, you know, kicking um, butt kicks, high knees, um, what we call opening the gate and closing the gate. So bringing your hip up, rotating it out, rotating it back in, just, just get your hips moving. Um, if you're, that's a little bit, if you have a little bit more room and f are free of equipment, but um, even uh, just some, some little squats, some lunges, just something to, to, to make your body start those motions um, before they're in that extreme stress environment. But it should be, I should emphasize the idea that we want these to be a, like a dynamic warm up where you're moving. Um, so not your traditional static stretching, but things where you're like, you know, as you're doing high knees that you're moving forward, as you're doing bucket, you're, mo you're moving forward um, so that it's, it's, it helps warm the muscles up as well as give you a little bit of a stretch. I think that's, that's a very great point. I think a lot of people, when they, they hear warm up, you know, the, the, everyone always thinks of just, you know, sitting there stretching, you know, laying out, stretching out your hamstrings or um, and, and well, you know, that is important. Yes, the dynamic component, especially in the cold environments, you know, like I said, warming your muscles up, getting the blood throwing, uh, flowing throughout your body, you know, so those muscles are ready to kind of handle, you know, that load, you know, it's really that dynamic warm up. Um, and, and I think you know, that's, you know, something people often have a misconception. I think warm up is just sitting there and, and stretching out your legs. Uh, but it's really, you, you need that dynamic aspect to really, um, you know, get your body ready to, to handle these sports. Um, I think we've touched on a few things, but Dr. Strickland, are there other mistakes that you commonly see people make when they, they're going out to these sports that you feel like we can try to help prevent them from, from developing these injuries? Um, I mean, what I, I think the main, main things are equipment. One thing I want to mention, especially because Dan's not on the call or not on the call yet, is um, there really is no reason to wear your pull straps. You can just hold on to your poles because... Um, it, it, that's one of the ways people do get wrist fractures and ski or thumb and you know your pole gets your you fall your pole gets caught on something and you end up with a wrist injury as opposed to if you just dropped your pole you lost your pole that's not the end of the world um and certainly getting on and off a chairlift your pole strap should be no bit nowhere near um around your wrist because you, know, you can get dragged off off a lift um so I think um, I get a lot of questions about this around this time of year. People are going skiing in January. I mean, this is the perfect time to start sort of getting in shape for that sport. So doing a more sports specific training program, you know, what muscles do you need specifically um, for skiing or for um, skating? You know, I think doing some squats, doing lunges, really working on your hip control, because if you're in a precarious position, the more you can um, be ready to fire your hamstrings, the more you can protect your ACL. So I think strong legs um, reduce injury rates, but unfortunately braces do not. So, you know, while it sounds great, you can just put on a brace and prevent an ACL injury. It just doesn't, doesn't work. So, you know, nobody really skis in a prophylactic um, brace. Yeah, again, you mentioned those hamstring exercises. I think that's, yeah, those are, are really important with ACL injuries. We know if you get imbalance between some of your leg muscles, so if your, your quad muscles get a little stronger than your hamstring, that can put a little bit more, more load on, um, you know, you know, the, the ACL. And so, yeah, I think, you know, it's one of those things where you can't do it, the, you know, the week before and say, oh, see, ski season, I'm going to go start doing my exercises. And like you said, really, you should be doing your exercises now. You're getting ready for, you know, January, for February. Um, and so really now is the time to start kind of getting into this program to, to start strengthening the legs to get ready for um, those, those ski injuries. I think another thing you mentioned equipment, you know, even kind of outside of the orthopedic realm um, is, you know, helmets are, are important. Um, anytime you're, you're skiing, snowboarding, um, you know, we know head injuries are a big, uh, big risk with, with either of those uh, activities. And, um, you know, well, you know, people unfortunately think helmets will uh, prevent everything. You know, concussion is obviously a, a big buzz topic these days. And, you know, yeah, unfortunately, while, while concussions haven't been, or helmets haven't been proven to prevent concussions, um, while you're, you're skiing, they definitely have been shown to prevent more serious, you know, skull fractures or, you know, the more significant, you know, intracranial 
um, you know, injuries. Um, so, you know, helmets definitely are, are a necessity if you're going out, uh, no matter how skilled you are, um, you know, you always want to make sure you, you have your helmet with you as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, you know, we've got, talked a little bit about skiing, snowboarding, but I know we know there's also some other, uh, you know, winter sports. We have our, our figure skaters, our hockey players. Um, you know, are there any, um, any specific exercises, Deb, you would recommend for like figure skaters or, or skaters more so than our skiers or snowboarders? Um, so um, it's, it's going to be all about the glutes, right? So um, particularly with your hockey players, you know, we see a lot of the hip injuries. Um, so keeping, keeping your, those glutes as strong as possible. Um, and then trunk stabilizers. So any sort of, you know, planking, um, any sort of single leg, act, single leg balance exercises um, so that you're really having to work those trunk stabilizers as well um, will play a, a, a big role in some of your, your, your hockey and your um, uh, figure skating. And, and to add to that, um, particular for, for all of these sports, but um, hip mobility. Um, so keeping, keeping for hockey players, keeping those hips as mobile as possible because they, those guys end up um, getting pretty tight and that ends up being problematic down the road. It's not as an acute of an injury, but. Um, and one of the things, that, one of the very few things I think that's been good about the pandemic is there has been an explosion of online um, workouts. And I think it's probably as simple. I mean, HSS has some online workouts, but um, Googling, um, get in shape for hockey or get in shape for skiing. Um, I um, just went on vacation and forgot that of course every gym is closed. And so I added a, a exercise bands to my travels um, carry on that I, I usually travel all the time. So, you know, especially to do some of that single leg, um, single leg and hip strengthening, just buying their $9 on Amazon, just some exercise bands. And you can do a lot of hip strengthening. You can do everything from donkey kicks when you're on all fours to hip abduction where you just stand on one leg and bring your leg out to the side. I'm sure Debbie has a million other suggestions, but you know, it's not like you need to do, um, you know, an hour of strengthening every day, but you know, 20 or 30 minutes targeted to your specific sport a few times a week, I think is really important. I think that's one thing I've, I've learned with, you know, with everything going on with COVID and, and people not having access to gyms, you know, there, there's a lot that you can do on your own at home. You don't need these, you know, big fancy equipment. You don't need these machines. You know, there's a lot of important exercises you can do to strengthen your glutes, strengthen your core, um, and you either just bands at home or just body weights. And, and yeah, I think there are great programs. Like you mentioned, you know, we have some great programs on, on our, our website. Um, and, 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 you know, you, you don't need, you know, people think, oh, if I can't go to the gym, I can't work out. But, you know, there's a lot you can do at home without any, you know, any equipment necessary. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so switching gears now kind of into the meat of, of the discussion here, which I think why a lot of people are here is really trying to prevent injuries. So, you know, we'll kind of go through our, our different winter sports here. Um, and so you know, we, we've talked about a few things for, for skiers, snowboarders. Are there any other, you know, prevention tips that you can think of, Dr. Strickland or, or, or Debbie, that you, you would kind of pass along to our, our viewers? I think probably the... Um, we talked a lot about strengthening and that's obviously super important, but when you, when you talk about some of the more um, endurance type sports uh, is um, a gradual buildup. So, I mean, obviously you can't necessarily, it's a little bit harder when you talk about like skiing to gradually build up your, your total workload. Um, but in those cases, then, then you, then you got to do something else, whether it's get on the stationary bike, run something else to get your total workload up so that we don't see as many of the, the overuse type injuries. Um, there's a couple of questions on the, on the chat, I think that are pertinent right now. So, um, David, you might have a better answer for this prevention tip for the more serious injuries, like a traumatic brain injury. I mean, we talked about helmets, um, yeah, so really, you know, unfortunately, I mean, helmets is yeah, definitely going to help prevent the more serious traumatic brain injuries. So a concussion is a, a, a kind of on the spectrum of, a, of traumatic brain injury. It's considered a mild traumatic brain injury, but there are obviously moderate, severe traumatic brain injuries. And that's where the helmets really come in, in handy. I mean, that's what they help prevent is those more serious injuries, you know, bleeding in the, in the brain. And so really, helmets is the number one tip. Obviously, you know, skiing, snowboarding safely, you know, try not to go through, you know, trees or, you know, make sure you're, you're skiing at your level. You're not going on a run that you're just not, you know, really able to, to handle. 
Um, but yeah, that would be really the main tip for, um, you know, for, for kind of the, the, the head injuries. And I think, yeah, I see also the question about um, wrist guards. Um, you know, yeah, so for snowboarding, yeah, I think there, there actually is some good evidence that, that wearing wrist guards can help prevent, you know, wrist and, and, and hand injuries. Um, you know, yeah, there's some thought that, you know, could that then kind of transition the force up a little higher into more than the, the shoulder and upper arm. But I think there, there's enough studies that, that suggest that, you know, you know, wearing wrist guards can prevent, you know, wrist and, and hand injuries. And so I think you're definitely um, something worth, you know, using as part of your equipment when you're out there um, skiing and, and or snowboarding, really more in particular with, with the risk with, with wrist injuries. And I think just adding on to what, what Debbie was saying with kind of just trying to build up your, your total strength and, and your endurance you know, I always, you know, it's always the classic story with patients when they come in, you know, like I said before, it's always either the first run of the day or it's the last run of the day. It's never anywhere in between. I think that last run of the day part of it is, you know, it's just fatigue and, you know, you're, you get tired. You don't realize, you know, how much, you know, you're, you're expending while you're out there skiing, snowboarding, and you think, oh, one more run, I'll just, you know, do one more run I have in me and, and your muscles just are, are too fatigued to kind of handle that load. And so, you know, one tip I always give is, you know, it, it, always think about, is it really worth that last, that one last run? Are you really able to, you know, handle that? Because that's oftentimes where we see a lot of the injuries is that, you know, last run when people are fatigued, tired, and, and they're just not, you know, the body's just not able to protect themselves the way they, they, they need to. The, the other aspect of that is, um, so I always tell people, if you're debating one last run, the answer is always no because it's always the worst conditions of the day. If it's warmer, it softens up. If it's colder, it's, it's, it's icier. So um, of course there always has to be a last run of the day, but if, if you're debating it, maybe not, especially at the beginning of the season. Another question from um, one of our participants is that they had ACL reconstruction on both of their knees. The last one was 15 years ago. And do I recommend bracing or taping? Um, often I have patients brace the first year or two after surgery, and then I tell them afterwards, it's up to them. If they feel more secure in a brace, they could certainly wear one. Um, since 50% of, of patients 10 years out from an ACL do have some degree of arthritis, this is a good time for sort of tune-up season. So I have a lot of patients who have a little bit of arthritis come in in December to do gel shots, or um, if their arthritis is a bit worse, potentially cortisone injections, sort of just you want your body feeling as good as possible, especially before a sport that involves um, a lot of uh, sort of bursts of energy like skiing. Um, hockey, I, I see a lot of people competing in hockey season with the same sort of, they would need a tune up to get ready for the season. And not to, not to beat a dead horse on the strengthening thing, but um, the best bet too with, as far as when you talk about bracing or K-tape, um, is, is making your body its own brace. So using, using your muscles as an internal brace. So another plug for the idea of getting, getting as strong as possible before you go into the season. And Debbie, I tell patients, but I don't actually know what you guys think about it. I say, you know, if, if the kinesio tape makes you feel better, ask your therapist, you know, to try to teach you how to do it. Because yes, I agree, you don't want to rely on that. But you know, you watch the Olympics in the summer and you see there's tape all over everybody. So if, if tape makes you feel better, by all means, Right. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. I say if it's, if it's, if it helps, it's never, I never think something's wrong if it helps for sure. Um, but you know, if the, it, it's best, I also don't want people to think, Oh, I've got my K tape on. Like I'm going to like, I'm okay. Like I can, I can, it makes me invincible. Um, so I think the idea is if you feel like you absolutely have to have it to go, then I say no. Um, but if you, you know, if it makes you feel better, then, then absolutely. Yeah. And so you know, switching gears, I mean, you mentioned hockey, you know, we haven't talked too much about hockey yet. I mean, so you know, injury prevention tips for, for hockey. I mean, I think the, the one I would always say is, and it, it sounds cheesy, but it's, it's been proven to be true is just follow the rules when you play. Um, I mean, I think they've, they've done studies that have, have shown that, you know, when, when players follow the rule, uh, and, and there's actually done studies in some leagues where they've actually affected the standings. They give more points to teams that have less penalties um, and, and take points away from teams that, that have more penalties. And, and they were able to show that the, the rate of injuries was much lower. Um, and so to me, for hockey, I think that the number one easy prevention tip is play safe and, and follow the rules. And, and I think that's been, been shown to help lower your, your risk of injury. I don't know, um, Debbie or Dr. Strickland, if you have any other thoughts on, on hockey in particular, any other 
prevention tips. I think we talked a little bit about you know, the glute strength and really making sure you're, you're ready to handle that load. But I don't know if you have any other thoughts on for our hockey players out there. Only – only that, you know, I sort of mentioned it, but let's say you're an older hockey player, you maybe have a lot of arthritis, which miraculously, that's a sport that a lot of my patients can do into their 50s, even with some pretty crappy looking x-rays as far as their knees. Um, if your knee is swelling, that does make it hard for your quad to fire adequately. So, you know, ice after the game, you know, maybe use some anti-inflammatories, but you don't, you don't really want to play a sport with swollen knees, especially one that you really need your knees for, like hockey. I think too, just just um, for the for the younger group is just keeping your hips as mobile as possible, because um, I noticed that as as the hockey players get older, their hips get get less and less mobile, um, and that becomes becomes more and more problematic both for their hips and for their knees. Um, so while while you're still young and pliable, uh, keep keep that mobility. I see a question here from um, from uh, some of our viewers about support tights. Do you have Debbie or Dr. Shogun? Do you have any thoughts on on support tights? Um, I think it's the same. I, I would go down the same road of of the KT tape. I mean, obviously, the support like that. If a brace isn't going to prevent an ACL injury, the, a, a tight isn't going to either. Um, but if it makes you you feel better, then then by all means, go for it. Um, but I also do go back to the idea, if you absolutely feel like you have to have it, then you've, that, that's your body telling you something else, that something else isn't functioning like it's supposed to. Um, so should be used as an adjunct. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a big opinion. I do love the compression socks. I like that you can get compression socks for everything now. Like, you know, I, I wear them in the OR, I wear them when I work out. So I, I think, you know, that's a little bit different. There's different, there's the support types that are supposed to sort of almost give you biofeedback. Um, if you feel good in them, I think that's perfectly fine. I think the compression um, socks can be great. Great, and then I think one of our other um, sports we were, we're trying to hit here is you know, for our figure skaters. Um, and I think, um, you know, for me, what, what I would say is, I mean, the biggest risk with, for figure skaters, especially our younger figure skaters is overuse injuries. It's, you know, one of those things where if you're just doing the same thing, over and over and over again, you know, your body, you know, just can't adapt and, and handle that load. And so, you know, for me, I, I, for our figure skaters, I, I would say, you know, make sure you're, you're kind of adding diversity to your workouts. You're not just on the ice every day doing the same thing over and over again. Make sure you're doing off ice workouts. Again, we're beating the dead horse and strengthening. Make sure you're spending the time to you know, do off, you know, off ice strengthening exercises. Um, and, and, you know, as, as the season begins, and, and unfortunately, oftentimes the other challenge is there is no beginning and end of seasons for, for our figure skaters. They're, playing year round, but, um, you know, if you are kind of getting back into, um, you know, skating and even for, for people that aren't competing in skating, you again, like with, with, we talked about with skiing, it's, you know, gradually building up, make sure you, you start slow, you know, don't go out seven days in a row and, and, and skate for an hour each day. Uh, make sure you kind of build up. Um, but I don't know, Dr. Strickland or, or Debbie, you have any other thoughts on prevention tips for our, our skaters out there? Well, one, one thing about, and certainly not to generalize to all skaters, but sports like gymnastics and skating, often um, you prioritize um, lower body weight and that, that's a little bit harder on your bones if you don't have enough nutrition. So, you know, really paying attention to your nutrition so you get enough nutrients to, to make it so that your bones are strong enough to withstand the impact of all of, of that repetitive, you know, competitive sk figure skaters don't skate two hours a week. You know, they, I think to, uh, taking a, um, having a, having a, a, an off season as small as, as small as it possibly can be, but, um, having an off season, just like we, you know, we tell baseball players to not pitch 12 months out of the year. Um, your body's got to have some sort of a break. Um, the, there's a couple questions on here about, um, running. And so I think you can generalize to any impact sport about after spine surgery. And um, having had spine surgery when I was 14, I can re relate to our, our viewers question. When you have a spine fusion, you have a lot less discs to absorb the impact. So whether it's ski jumping or landing a jump from uh, figure skating or running, um, I don't think it's the, personally, I don't think it's the best sport for somebody with um, a spine fusion. Some gentle running on a treadmill is probably fine, but I can tell you um, I'm 51. I stopped running when I was 31 because I didn't want to put too much disc after scrubbing in a bunch of spine surgeries on the 
uh, levels above my fusion. So, you know, I, I would try to pick a sport with lower impact than running if I could, if I had a spine fusion. I think I see another question, which is a good kind of transition here, talking about, you know, ways to recover after exercise. They specifically talk about like Theragun, Normatec. Debbie, do you have any thoughts on, on your recovery techniques after, you know, now that you've made it through your day on the slopes and, and didn't tear your ACL? what you can do uh, when you get back to the, the lodge? Um, I mean, certainly if you have access to a, a Normatec or a Theragun, like by all means, go for it. Um, it's a nice recovery. It's, it's a, a nice recovery tool um, to help make you feel a little bit better. I, like Dr. Strickland was saying earlier, the, the less pain that you're in, um, the better. So I think that those things help make you feel better. Um, I think if you don't necessarily have access to those, just even general ice, you know, um, in any areas that you are sore in. Um, so one thing I tell patients all the time is if you go to a college and certainly a professional sporting event and at halftime you go into the locker room, practically everybody has ice on something. So I'm like, if you have, you know, a problematic knee or whatever shoulder, um, it's perfectly reasonable at the end of the day um, to ice that extremity. And um, it's not easy to travel with gel packs unless you check your luggage, but those old fashioned screw top ice packs, um, you, you can always get ice and an ice bandage and just ice it over that extremity. I think that's you know, super easy to do no matter where you're traveling. We're talking about kind of recovery workouts. You know, and so even you know, people that do sustain injuries, maybe not as serious as an ACL or, or they have some bumps and bruises, you know, Dr. Sugar, do you have any tips on you know, when people should feel safe to get back on, you know, on the slopes or get back out on the ice when they've had an, an injury? I mean, I think in general, you have to feel essentially 100%. And whether you're a runner or not, you have to feel like you have to be able to run if you're going to be able to ski or if you're going to be able to play hockey. I don't mean you have to be able to go run five miles, but your lower extremities have to feel good enough that you could run and you could do squats and you have normal flexibility. And so, you know, the question here is what's the best substitute for a traditional barbell squat? So I personally, I guess it depends where you hold the barbells, but um, if you have access to a gym, I think the best quad strengthening is a leg press. And if you don't have access to a gym, I think having TRX bands at home helps um, you sort of do a somewhat supported squat, meaning you can, you can modify it depending on how much weight you have. If I'm, if I'm doing weighted squats, I like dumbbells and I like to hold the weight the weights posterior, almost like I'm doing a tricep kickback because I like the weight behind me, not in front of me. What do you think, Debbie? Um, yeah, I think I think absolutely. Like there's there's different places you can put, um, you know, hold it forward, hold it backwards. Um, if you hold it forward, it's going to make it a little bit easier because then it'll, it'll make it a little bit easier for you to sit back sit back into it. If you hold it back, um, it's going to make it a little bit harder for you to sit back into it, which will force you to do that even more. Um, so I guess I don't, I guess I'm assuming they're asking this because they don't have access to, um, to a squat rack. Um, but yeah, even like even 10 pounds, um, for, for, for squats, holding it in front of you, holding it behind you. Um, you can use, if you need just the resistance, you can use rogue bands, holding on, putting them at your feet, holding onto rogue bands um, will help give you that resistance if that's what you're looking for. I think I would just go back and, um, you know, talk about kind of re re your return to, to activities. I would echo what Dr. Strickland said. You know, to me, I always tell patients, it's kind of, it's a stepwise progression. And so to me, the easy thing is, yeah, if you can't do your daily activities without pain, you're probably not ready to be going back out on, on the ice or on the slopes. And then, yeah, you got to be able to handle, you know, again, you know, like I said, jogging those impact things first. And you just like we said, even when you start a season, you know, same thing when you get back, you don't think you're ready. Okay, I'm going to go back up to the, you know, the top of the mountain and, and go all the way down. You know, start, you know, start slow. You always know, say test your body first and see how it handles it. And, and, you know, as you just gradually incrementally add more and more stress, you know, if your body's able to handle it, you know, you can handle that load. You know, next time, go a little bit harder. If the body does fine with that, you know, you kind of keep adding. Uh, but yeah, to me, it's, it's always... You know, I, I have patients come in that they're, you know, say they're, they're limping around. They say, oh, well, can I go ski next week? And I, I tell them, well, if you, can't, if you can't walk around the house without pain, you know, I'm not sure we're ready to, to get you out on the slopes. And, and you know, like things like degenerative, degenerative arthritis, I always tell them, yeah, you, you may not be making it worse in the long run, but I'm not even necessarily just worried about your arthritis. I'm worried about you injuring something else or having to fall because you know, your legs just aren't able to handle it. And so really, you know, yeah, I would say you need to be, it's painful with your daily activities. You should have near or 
or almost you know symmetric you know, range of motion without pain, and then really just have you know full strength without pain before people start thinking about getting back to you know any of their of their sports. Um, and, and to me, that's where our, our physical therapy colleagues are, are are so great. You know, one you know they help you you know, get better, but they also can can help us kind of test you and, and see how you're doing if you're ready to handle the loads of being out on a, a, you know, a, you know, a mountain or being out on the, the rink. And that's partly, you know, one of the, the, the I think one of the, the best aspects of physical therapy is I, I tell my patients, if you can't do your exercises pain-free with a physical therapist, then there's no point in trying to do them on your own or go try out, go for a run or go try skiing because we know you're not gonna be able to handle that. And so that's where, you know, even with minor injuries, I'm a, a big, a big fan of physical therapy. I always say it's worth, you know, you, you may not need, you know, weeks and weeks of rehab, but even letting them just functionally test you, see where you're at, where your, your body's at, even symmetrically side to side, if they can tell you a lot about, you know, how ready you are to, to handle, you know, your, your loads. Debbie, I think raised the bar high for you there. I don't know if you have any, uh, any thoughts about that. No, I think, I think um, hopefully, particularly if you've had a more serious injury, like an ACL reconstruction, rotator cuff repair, something like that, um, you've got a good place to go where they can put you through some return to sport testing um, before you even go out and try. Yeah, and on that, that same note, so, you know, after um, an upper extremity surgery, an upper extremity injury, um, especially talking more about shoulder, which, which I um, do that type of surgery, I think, um, you know, as far as skiing or snowboarding, as long as you have essentially pretty full range of motion and without pain and you are relatively strong, it's okay because you don't, you need good balance and you need to be able to move your hands in snowboarding. But if, if your shoulder strength isn't hundred percent, I think potentially that's, that's okay. If it's 80%, I'll potentially let you, you snowboard. Um, it's completely different if you are cross country skiing where you really need to pull and then you need your arms to be hundred percent strong. And, um, you know, I don't see a lot of cross country skiing injuries. We don't have as many cross country skiers around the New York city area, but you know, we, we obviously depend on the snow, but if you go out west or you go a little bit farther up north, um, I think it's a great winter sport. It's a great workout. It's low impact for your legs. And if you're, you know, you're, and you're using your upper body, so it's really, you know, a whole body workout. Um, so, I mean, I think in this year of, you know, gyms being closed or limited access to gyms, I think it's a sport if people want to try a new one that's worth starting. And with that in mind, I mentioned obviously this being a unique year with, with COVID, you know, now with, with, um, you know, with that, Dr. Strickland, are there certain ways, you know, I think people are, are worried about accessing doctors or they're waiting, they don't want to go to a hospital, they don't want to be seen even if they have an injury, you know, are there ways, you know, that they can still get care at HSS, how, you know, how, how's your office handling it? So, I mean, we found that our office, the patients coming into the office are far different than they were a year ago. I mean, a year ago, somebody would come in with, um, you know, four weeks of shoulder pain and I, I might send them to a little physical therapy and they might take a little bit of Advil. Now I would say the vast majority of my patients are waiting till it's like the bitter end. Like they cannot move their arm at all. They're, they have a complete rotator cuff tear that needs surgery. The acuity or the seriousness of patients problems is really high. And you know, what I glean from that is that um, it, I don't think at this point you have to just, grin and bear it quite as long. So I think what you're referring to is telehealth. Like I never ever did a Zoom patient visit before um, COVID, but now that you know everybody's sort of got Zoom on their computer, it's, it's not nearly as good as looking at them in, in person, but I can check a number of things um, virtually just like we're doing right now on video. And um, pretty quickly I can find out if you've lost range of motion, and it may be as simple as just setting you up with a Zoom physical therapist. They teach you some exercises. And if you're not getting better, I can refer you for an MRI. Or I can say, wow, you know, this really looks like a big deal. I think it's worth coming to Stanford or coming into the city. So um, I think people, at least my sense is they're waiting a lot longer than they need to. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's what's happening. I see in our office in Paramus as well, where, um, you know, yeah, people are, are, you know, just trying to, to, to avoid doctor's offices at, at, at all costs. And, and fortunately, sometimes that is you know, a detriment to you. If you have an injury, you know, yeah, it definitely can get worse if you, if you wait too long. And so, yeah, you know, I think at this point, whether it is telehealth or, you know, again, with the precautions that we're taking in our offices, you know, again, you know, if you have a, a, an acute injury, especially in, in especially lower extremity, if, you, if you're having trouble bearing weight, if your ankle, your knee is huge and swollen, 
you know, definitely at least at least a telehealth visit, if not come into the office, let us take a look. And yeah, again, even for things that are a little more chronic um, that may just need physical therapy. I know you, you mentioned, and I've been using a lot with our, our therapists, and I think our HSA therapists are doing a lot of, of virtual therapy. And I don't know, Debbie, if you can speak to that, you know, you know how, how helpful you think that is still for patients. You know, you, you know, is there a dramatic difference between telehealth and, and in-person in terms of, you know, how much you can do for them, you know, with, with that format? I mean, I think certainly it will always be more ideal to have our hands on people. Um, but no, I mean, the, my patients that have done it, like it's, it's been very successful. Sometimes it's even, it's nice because they're taking me into their environment. So whatever they've got at home, which is what they're going to ultimately have to do, like, like I can see it and say, no, no, why don't you use that, that thing, use that step over there. Or, you know, why don't you, no, no, don't do that on the floor. Don't do that on the bed. You know, so it, it, it may ultimately help them with, with their home exercise program that they're, they're going to have to do for a while. So. I never, ever would have believed that you could do zoom physical therapy, but I even have a number of patients working out on zoom with the trainer. But I think, you know, part of the reason um, not to say that therapy isn't super important, but part of the reason therapy or even working out with the trainer can be so helpful is it keeps you on schedule and with with somebody watching how you're moving making sure you're sort of moving correctly it sort of keeps you on track you know as opposed to just watching a video and hope you do it all uh, correctly so i think that's been really helpful and i think a lot of patients who were too busy or their schedule really didn't allow for in-person pt now they're working from home potentially and that they can fit it in um, a little bit more easily so um back to coming into the office i mean HSS has changed um, all the protocols as far as how we space out patients in the office and how things are cleaned in between. And so I would say patients feel really safe even um, coming into the city. And um, you know, it's it's not crowded. We certainly are still limited as far as how many patients we see. And we make every effort to like make it a one-stop shop. Meaning, if if we know you're coming in and you probably need an MRI, we try our best to get it all done the same day, just so you know we can sort of get you. Um, "Quote unquote," back in the game without too many trips to uh, to the hospital. Yeah, and, and, and I know we've talked a lot in, about you know these injuries, and, and you know, we probably made it seem like you know people who haven't started these sports may never want to do them now because they're just worried they're going to go tear their ACL on on the, the slopes. But you know, for those that, that are thinking about starting a new sport, you know, skiing for the first time, or maybe going skating, or um, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about you know some ways to kind of help them, you know, starting slow, but. Uh, any any tips you have for for beginners who want to try a, a new sport, um, either Dr. Strickland or, or Debbie? So, I mean, I think the best way to start any of the sports we've mentioned, um, cross country skiing, downhill skiing, skating, is um, swimming. I know this is winter sports, but when typically um, is take some lessons. I mean, there there's a, just just like you go to school and um, learn from a teacher. I mean, I think taking lessons is is really helpful. I mean, it, it makes a, a huge difference as far as enjoying the sport. I mean, if you go out there on an icy day, your first, I still remember my first day skiing. I think I was 11. Um, it was miserable. I remember some of the first days of my kids skiing. And so um, I think uh, taking lessons is, is really important. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think, yeah, you, there's a lot um, you know, they, you, you, you don't, there's a lot you don't know, and you can try to figure it out on your own, but yeah, the, the safest way is let someone teach you correctly the first time, and, and you know, hopefully that will, will help uh, prevent some injuries in the future. I think we have a question here. Uh, Debbie, I don't know if you may want to take it. Do you prefer stretching before or after sports? Um, I prefer a dynamic warm-up, um, a dynamic stretch before. Um, I think that that ultimately what we know from the research is that that's probably the best. Um, and then uh, if you want to do static stretching, do it afterwards. The, the dynamic, the dynamic warm up will get you stretched out and get you warmed up. Um, and it is going to keep you at your most effective. Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with that, especially again with our winter sports, the cold environment, you definitely need that dynamic, you know, part of the warm up. You're going to just try to do some static stretching. Um, that's really not going to get your body warmed up enough to to be out there in the in the cold. So yeah, like you said, I think the evidence has shown it really static stretching is, is probably more beneficial after you've been active when your muscles are already all warmed up, as opposed to just going out there and, and you know trying to start with with static stretching. Um, 
And I think uh, we, we have just a few more minutes. So if any of uh, the viewers have any more questions, feel free to um, you know, make sure you, you uh, post them. We'd be happy to, to address them. And then in our last few minutes, Dr. Strickland or Debbie, any, any thoughts or comments that, that you've had that you would, would like to add on? So, you know, at the beginning of, of COVID, you know, it was impossible to buy an exercise bike or a bike because the whole world, all of the United States went out and bought a bike. Um, I think that's the time to buy snowshoes. Um, so people have been walking. I mean, I've had patients coming in, they're walking 10,000, 15,000 steps a day. And obviously, you know, when it's icy or snowy, that's not, not quite as safe, but most of us have been walking in parks. And so if we're in parks, we have access to off pavement walking and snowshoes are cheap. Um, it's a great workout. It's sort of like a weighted walk. And, um, I think, um, that's a, if you're going to purchase anything sort of for your day-to-day -day workout, I think that would be my number one suggestion. And I, think yeah, I think that's really important to think about too, is even not even just for our athletes, but even as winter comes just for every day-to-day you know, -day, people walking around, you know, yeah, we've been, you know, people getting an escape from their houses, going for walks. And now where there's ice and there's snow, you know, it's, you know, people still are going to want to get out of their house and making sure they're doing that safely. You know, even just outside of sports, you know, in the winter, we see a lot more obviously falls, you know, it affects, you know, you know broken bones, you know, your wrists, hips. And, and so it's also important to think about even outside of sports in general, yeah, you know, how to safely still even just exercise, just, you know, again, going for our walks, you know, also getting dark at four o'clock, you know, making sure you're, you know, we have good, you know, reflective lighting on you, you know, you have, you know, you can see where you're going, um, just even prevent just, just regular falls. Um, you know, yeah, I think definitely important to, to think about that as well. Debbie, I know I, I may have cut you off. I'm sorry, did you have a, did you have a... No, I was just gonna say, um, I think, you know, just being prepared. And we've obviously, we've, we've gone over all the different ways of, of being prepared from your, um, from your equipment to your strengthening, to your uh, build up program, but just, you know, uh, being as prepared as possible.